counting. Hello and welcome to Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. I am your host, Raya Salter. I'm an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. I'm also the principal attorney of Imagine Power LLC. So today we're going to take a look at some important energy and utility news from Hawaii, around the country, and the world as reported in the last week. First, let's take a look at some recent developments in clean energy and clean energy policy in the islands. So we're going to take a relatively deep dive into two topics I think that have been extremely important um, this week. One is what I think could be called a bombshell article in the Honolulu Star Advertiser by Catherine Mickelseth that, while has not been a secret, really put on the front page the fact that Hawaii's wealthy make up the majority of residents um, who have rooftop solar and the majority of tax credits and subsidies, i.e. subsidies, that have gone towards that industry have gone to the wealthy. Um, this is, of course, nothing, not a secret, really, but I think it's bombshell that it's front page news. And the second thing we're going to spend some time talking about is uh, the Trump administration's withdrawal of the climate, uh, the Paris Climate Accord, and what that means for uh, what Hawaii officials feel about that and what that means for cities um, and also for the nation. So let's go ahead and dig into it. Now, Hawaii's wealthy make up the majority of residents who have rooftop solar, and at the same time, two programs the state has created to change that are foundering. So, Governor David Ige signed a law to create a community solar program in 2015. The program would help low-income rent, low, would help renters and low-income families benefit from solar. But the details of the program are still being debated, and it will take at least six months to implement once all the parties even agree to a plan. So another project that, um, or effort that came forward to spur clean energy was a loan program created by the state in 2013 to help make energy more affordable for low-income families. So. The Green Energy Market Securitization, or GEMS, program raised roughly $150 million through a bond sale, but has lent less than 2 percent of the funds to date, missing the original goal to have issued all the funds by the end of November 2016. Meanwhile, the only incentives that have been successful have gone primarily to the wealthy, according to state chief economist Eugene Tian. According to Tian, the higher the household income, the more PV installation, Tian said. From 2011 to 2014, some 43 percent of residents who claim the state's renewable energy tax credit made more than $100,000 a year, an income bracket that accounts for just 14 percent of the population. So, with nearly 78,500 78, photovoltaic systems connected to the grid, Hawaii has, it has the highest per capita solar penetration in the United States. Now, it got there with the help of the state tax credit, a generous payment to solar system owners for the excess energy their systems send to the grid, and Hawaiian Electric Company's high electric bills. So, roughly 16 percent of HECO customers now have solar. Now, since 2009, Hawaii has offered a 35 percent tax credit for solar systems. That's in addition to a 30 percent federal tax credit. But to earn the tax credits, a homeowner must first pay for the system, a barrier too high for some low-income families. Let's face it, most low-income families. The average price for solar installations was $28,400 in May, according to state data. So the biggest barrier to solar ownership is home ownership. Hawaii home ownership is third lowest in the nation. About 57 percent of residents own their homes. Tian said the vast majority of single-family homes with PV are owned by the residents who occupy them. The most popular areas for installation are Mililani, Pearl City, Aiea, Diamond Head, Kahala, Ainahaina, Hawaii Kai, Kailua, and Lani Kai. So renters are essentially out of luck when it comes to benefiting, benefiting from the solar incentives. Mark Duda, principal at Distributed Energy Partners, said a community solar program is necessary to break the barriers of entry. Historically, says Duda, you've needed in one way or another to own or control property in order to participate in rooftop solar or bill offsetting programs. 
Community Solar breaks that linkage. But ECO has rejected the PUC Community Solar Plan that would allow renters to pay a set, a month, set amount per month in return for a share of the electricity produced by a solar farm. But the program, so the program is far from reality in Hawaii. After two years of discussions, state regulators and Hawaiian Electric Company have not agreed on the program's details, including how much renters would be credited for solar power. The Public Utilities Commission came up with a plan for community solar, but as the, Catherine mentions in the article, HECO rejected it. Uh, on Tuesday, HECO said it would pursue legal action to avoid putting in place the program proposed by the PUC. The PUC said it could take up to six months for HECO to launch the program even after all parties agree on its details. Similarly, the GEMS program has done little to help renters and low-income homeowners. Seven months since the GEMS program was supposed to fully deploy its $150 million fund to help families save on energy costs, the state has lent only $2.8 million while spending $2.9 million on administrative costs. Ratepayers are covering the costs of GEMS through the green infrastructure fee on their monthly bill. That money will be used to pay for interest, interest payments on the bonds sold to fund GEMS. During the 15-year life of the bonds, interest will total $33 million. Gwen Yamamoto Lau, the fourth executive director of GEMS since it was launched in 2014, said her team is working as fast as possible to meet the needs of the state's energy market, but added there were some unreleased, unrealistic deployment expectations set when the idea of GEMS was being sold to the legislature back in 2012 and 2013. The original director of the program, Richard Lim, was appointed by Governor Neil Abercrombie and left the post when Ige appointed a new director in 2014. Lim set up GEMS when he was director of the State Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. Lim declined to comment for Catherine's article. So one bill currently waiting for Ige's signature would use $46 million of the GEMS money to finance energy efficiency measures for the Department of Education. Yamamoto Lau said the program is also looking to provide solar, wa hot, water, solar hot water heaters on Molokai, adding that the program's board approved $9.6 million for that project. Another effort taken up by Yamamoto Lau's team is to offer an on-bill financing option to Hawaiian Electric Company customers. This option would allow loans for solar systems to be paid back through customers' electric bills. Yamamoto Lau said she is also working on a program that would motivate landlords to install PV. She said the program will provide the financing mechanism coupled with incentives for landlords to install solar systems on behalf of their tenants. So that was, that was a lot. So let's talk about that and break it down. Now, for anyone who's um, spent any time watching this show, you know these are issues that we have talked about, talked about at some length. First, I think there, I want to talk a little bit about why it is so important to make sure that there is equity, um, energy equity and energy with regards to um, clean energy systems. It is, it is, I think, one of the reasons that the net metering program was actually shuttered is that there was um, a concept that um, the more that the wealthy move off of the grid means that those who are left behind on the grid or lower income people um, are then responsible to pay a larger portion uh, of, of the grid to keep the grid going, and that the wealthy leave the grid, and that leaves lower income people stranded on the grid. Now, that's something that has been talked about for a long time and has been controversial. I think that over recent years, and we've talked about this a lot, the dialogue amongst environmental advocates and utilities has changed some, somewhat, and industry has changed somewhat. It used to be that the utility would say, hey, and a clean energy providers, we, this net metering rate, paying the full retail price of energy um, when people sell their electricity back to the grid, this is too high. It does not take into account costs that we have to take on to manage the grid and to manage the solar energy, and it's almost provide, like providing free services to that customer. Meanwhile, other customers may feel a detriment. Solar industry and some solar advocates were hit back at that idea pretty hard. Several, a few years ago, I think the, the tenor of that dialogue has changed as the clean energy industry has matured, costs of PV in particular have come down. And I think there's an understanding that perhaps 
in some instances, the retail rate of energy was a type of incentive to see this industry get on its legs and see can this industry really fly on its own. So that net metering concept has been changing all across the country, and there have been similar battles uh, with in terms of between industry and customers and other stakeholders and sort of saying, what is the right price of, of, of energy? And there's a lot of policy that has come along with that. However, recent studies have started com coming out saying that in areas specifically mentioning Hawaii, there is an LBNL study that we talked about on this program. When you get these high levels of penetration, you really do start seeing a, a equity skew from the, the lower income to the higher income people when we're talking about um, rooftop PV. So that is one piece when we're talking about equity in terms of what, who gets to benefit from clean energy and what does that mean for everybody else. Now what we're talking about in this story, in addition to that, really goes to say, okay, let's take a look at the incentives. Let's take a look at those state incentives. Let's take a look at what that means when you couple it with the federal incentives. Who has really benefited from that? And I think the tail of the tape will say, will show, that the wealthy have benefited from that and the industry has benefited from that. Now, I'm not here to say that that is necessarily incorrect, but I do think that it is time for us to take a more macro view in terms of the subsidies that are being um, made available and looking at what segments of society are these, are these subsidies, call it a subsidy, call it a tax credit, what have you, what sectors of society is it reaching? Because the, of course, the, the overarching concept is if we can't crack the nut of regular folks and low income folks, of more people in general, universal access of clean energy, we're not going to get there, period, and we're going to be lurching towards a system of greater inequity that is also unable to wean itself off of fossil fuel. So that is sort of one piece of this discussion and this debate. I also want to, want to respond to the, the discussion about the GEMS program. We have talked about the beleaguered GEMS program. It has been years and years. There's a lot of money to go towards the GEMS program and folks have been very disappointed at the result. But I personally believe that we need to support the concept of the GEMS program, we need to support Gwen Yamamoto Lau and her team, and we need to make sure that they get some wins because the models across the country are out there. These funds can be used to help low-income folks, middle-class folks, and folks who do not own their homes. We'll talk a little bit more about this when we come back after the break. Aloha, you're watching Power of Hawaii. This guy look familiar? He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go, 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 go. Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Welcome back to Power Up Hawaii. We've been talking about equity in the energy system. We've been talking about the big article that Catherine Mickelseth wrote for the Honolulu Star Advertiser that really laid bare some of the efforts that have happened under Ige and the Abercrombie administration to try and democratize clean energy access for folks and how there have been some hiccups there. I wanted to emphasize again, I think we have to stop calling GEMS beleaguered. We've got to support GEMS and we've got to support what it means for to invest in uh, low income and low income renewables and also renewables for folks who don't own or control their homes. I'll talk a little bit later if we get to it in the, in the, um, in the program. New York has just invested $1.5 billion in a clean energy program that's designed to create 20,000 green energy jobs by 2020. So GEMS 
still has some money that uh, the idea of a green bank, the idea of investing in these types of projects and making, help making them happen is important. It's happening all across the country, New York, Connecticut. And this is something I think we need to rally behind GEMS. We need to rally behind Ms. Uh, Yamamoto Lau and see some wins happen for the state. I also want to comment a bit about the community solar we've talked at length about community solar on this program. We've talked to folks in California and how the Environmental Defense Fund is working with utilities there and community solar projects. We've talked about community solar projects in New York, and we've talked about the efforts that are happening here. Things have slowed down. We really, we really do need to see some of these things move forward. We need to get some wins. If we need to consolidate and, and, and just pick some projects and figure out how to get this done and to start moving forward, this is sort of a general anecdotal type comment, but we do need to start seeing some community solar. I fear as much as we are on the cutting edge of clean energy advancements here, we are beginning, I think our policy is beginning to get behind the eight ball a little bit, and I would love to see the ship sort of sail forward. But we are, I want to have hope, I, I want to be supportive of Gwen, I want to be supportive of all our lawmakers and policymakers, because these are challenging. These are challenging uh, issues for the utility who, again, I think does deserve credit for doing a good job of managing the highest level of PV penetration in the country. And it was not HECO who asked for the, you know, the, the subsidy or the, um, the tax credit. Well, actually, I'll take that back. Who knows? Perhaps they were supportive of it. But HECO deserves some credit for, for managing a, one of the most challenging um, situations in the United States. So we'll go ahead and move on. Let's talk a little bit about what Hawaii's lawmakers and members of the state's congressional delegation are thinking about President Trump's decision Thursday to pull out the United States out of a global agreement aimed at slowing the pace of global warming. So we know that President Trump made a big announcement speaking from the White House Rose Garden on Thursday, announcing his intentions to abandon the Paris Climate Accord, saying it could hurt U.S. workers and unfairly handicaps the American economy. So. There is a lengthy exit process outlined in the deal, which means the U.S. would remain in the agreement, at least formally, through 2020. However, Trump said, as of today, the United States will cease all implementation of the non-binding Paris Accord. So, after this announcement, Governor David Ige said Hawaii was already taking steps to implement the Paris Accord and would continue to do so. Hawaii will continue to fulfill its kuleana on reaching our energy, water, land, and other sustainability goals to make island earth a home for all, Ige said in a statement. The innovation economy is driven by technology, clean energy, and green jobs. We will continue to lead on this transformation and work collaboratively with the people of the world to do so. Uh, so, a measure approved by this year's legislature calls for the state to adopt the greenhouse reduction targets in the Paris Agreement. Ige has not yet signed the bill, but an expedited review is likely, given Trump's announcement on Thursday. So, State Senator Jay Kalani English, one of the bill's co-authors, said adopting the international PACS goal is necessary because Hawaii is extremely susceptible to climate change. We're feeling the effects of it more so than most other states in the Union because we're completely surrounded by water. We are seeing sea level rise, English said. In the last few years, we've had lightning storms, thunderstorms, out-of-season storms, more intense storms. These are all part of climate change. Scientists say Earth is likely to reach more dangerous levels of warming sooner as a result of the president's decision because America's pollution contributes so much to rising temperatures, the AP reports. Now, Hawaii already has a greenhouse gas reduction law. The legislation, approved in 20, 2007, seeks a 16 percent reduction in carbon emission by the year 2020 from large facilities like power plants and refineries. Some of the largest energy users in the state, like the city, are looking to reduce their carbon footprint. The city wants to reduce its energy consumption by 30 percent over the next 13 years. In a statement Thursday, Mayor Kirk Caldwell said the president's decision to pull out of the climate deal is an abandonment of American leadership and a threat to island communities like our own here in Hawaii. He added, 
my administration is dedicated to continuing on the Paris path, and I am confident that this voice of federal leadership will be filled by local governments, cities, and mayors across the nation. On Twitter, U.S. Senator Brian Schatz, who of course has been an outspoken critic of the president's climate policies, said the decision left him angry, not deterred. We will win this fight, but we must be smarter, tougher, and more relentless than the polluters and their friends. In another tweet, he wrote, Dear Trump administration, please stop doing insane things. Signed, Future Generations. U.S. Senator Maisie Hirono was similarly incensed, calling the decision irresponsible and short-sighted. In Hawaii, we understand why it's important to take care of our land, ocean, and air. Our way of life depends on it, Hirono said in a statement. Today, it's more important than ever for, the, for states like Hawaii to boldly take the lead on clean energy innovation and good stewardship of our aina. So, President Trump's decision to leave the Paris Accord has been widely panned by world leaders and clean energy advocates, and now state leaders are voicing their support for the agreement as well. So, this is really the story I really wanted to dig into a bit, just so you could hear the words of our representatives. Uh, it is, we know that our representatives are pro-clean energy and pro-climate, good climate policy. But I think it's important to look at what are the words, what are our leaders doing to stand up to this catastrophic, catastrophic withdrawal from the Paris Accord. Now, we've all read, a, I don't need, probably don't need to say that without, without the Paris Accord and without the United States um, committing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, it's hard to see how we can reach goals for greenhouse gas emissions reductions and avert catastrophic climate change. So this is enormously consequential. Don't believe the line that this agreement hurts jobs. Um, and uh, it, there's really, you know, I think that industry itself, including Exxon, has come forward to say, we want to stay in this deal. So it is cynical, the arguments to pull out. But something I want to mention that I've talked about a lot on this show, it is important for states, island states like Hawaii and also other island states to make big, bold commitments to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But I think it's extremely important to note, it is not because that the emissions that we produce are making a whit of difference in terms of um, um, averting catastrophic climate change, because they're not. <laughs> We do not need to be reducing greenhouse gas emissions for reducing greenhouse gas emissions' sake. Should we be focused on uh, creating the green energy economy? Yes. Should we be focused on reducing energy poverty? Yes. Should we be focused on reducing the uh, sh reducing or shrinking the footprint of the energy system, re eliminating carbon for energy security and health reasons? Yes. But hear me now and hear me later. Hawaii is a victim to international greenhouse gas emissions, including our own mainland. The seas are rising. In decades, not generations, Hawaii will be seeing the effects. So it's important that Hawaii adhere to Paris for solidarity to show this is the right thing to do, to use moral authority to move forward with Paris, because without action, urgent action to avert greenhouse gas emissions, Hawaii is, is and other islands, and of course the rest of the world ultimately, is facing catastrophic climate change. So I wanted to dig into what our local officials were saying. Now, the next story talks a bit about, I think after the announcement was made, there was a really a tremendous outcry from other states and cities who are vowing to uphold the Paris Climate Accord goal. Um, even if the administration wants to pull out of it. So, a dozen states and Puerto Rico have formed the U.S. Climate Alliance and committed to reducing emissions 26 or 28 percent from 2005 levels, while meeting or exceeding the targets of the Obama administration's clean power plan. Led by Washington, New York, and California, the parties have committed to uphold their end of the U.N. Paris Climate Accord, which President, President Trump, of course, um, decided to abandon. A wide range of business interests, from tech companies to fossil fuel producers, also indicated their support for the agreement before Trump's announcement. 
So several cities have also indicated they will increase their clean energy goals in support of climate efforts, and mayors representing more than 50 million residents are also pledging efforts to combat climate change. So cities, towns, they're going to step forward, states, we're going to do this. And I'm going to mention something else that I think is important for somebody who has been an environmental advocate um, for many years and also a community organizer. Look what this is saying, guys. It's about to get local. We're going to have to organize, and we're going to have to build a movement that is more inclusive. We're going to have to empower folks in cities. We're going to have to figure out this community solar situation, the situation of folks in buildings and the emissions that they cause. We're going to have to figure out these issues, or we, um, we aren't going to be able to avert catastrophic climate change. So Hawaii is on the absolute leading edge of that. So in our last story, I think there's something that's so interesting that was reported on Bloomberg that I just wanted to report. So this is about Prince. Prince, the pop musician, turns out he was a benefactor of green energy. So before he died, he made an investment in green energy that's now helping solar startups. So in 2011, Prince spoke to a fellow named uh, Van Jones, a CNN commentator and human rights ag agitator, as I would like to describe himself, and one-time green jobs advisor to President Barack Obama. He said, if I have a quarter million dollars, what can I do with it? And Jones recalled in an interview, my wife said he should put solar panels all over Oakland. So that led to the creation of Powerhouse, a rare for-profit incubator dedicating to putting clean tech entrepreneurs together with investors. And it's helped 43 startups get on their feet in an era where venture capital funding for renewables has plunged. So really cool story, who knew? And, and the story also says that Prince wanted the, his involvement in this to remain anonymous. So we love you, we miss you, Prince. And I'm so glad to report that he was a, he believed in clean energy and he wanted to see folks in Oakland and other people, other places and other people succeed to create clean energy. So with that, we will say goodbye. Thank you so much for watching Power Up Hawaii. Malo Mahalo and Aloha.